Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 2 as we continue to study uh, the book of Romans uh, verse by verse. I uh, reminded you last week that we are entering uh, in this section of Romans a difficult uh, passage of scripture for some folks uh, and it continues all the way until verse uh, 21 of chapter 3. So it can be a long haul and I'm going to do my best uh, to try to navigate uh, your way through this passage so that you'll understand uh, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us and why it's critical for us to understand uh, each and every verse of this passage. So this morning uh, we will look at Romans uh, chapter 2 and we are beginning uh, in uh, verse uh, 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God, so now he has changed the conversation, if you recall. Uh, he was talking uh, to Gentiles, which is uh, uh, the uh, biblical umbrella category for unbelievers, and he's reminding the Gentiles uh, that because they are created in the image of God, uh, that they have equally received the disclosure of God. His revelation is written across the conscience of mankind, so that no one is is going to ever be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know. I had no idea. Uh, but due to general revelation, as we learn, God has revealed himself in all that he has created in nature, so that there is no one who does not know in their heart of hearts that they have been created in his image, and therefore are morally culpable to the standards that God has written across the conscience of all mankind. Now, after having said that, he turns to the second category of people sitting there in the church at Rome, if you can imagine this. He is now going to speak directly uh, to Jewish uh, Christians, uh, because Jewish Christians say, well, of course the Gentiles don't know from nothing. We, however, are unique because we have been the recipients historically of the written law of God, written by God's own finger in stone on Sinai, brought down to us by Moses himself. Therefore, we're unique and special, and you can fully anticipate the Gentiles to be struggling, but we, on the other hand, have not just general revelation, we have special revelation. Uh, so that's now who he talks to, and what he's going to say is, well, I'm sorry, but you're not off the hook either. Uh, so let's see what he says. But if a, you call yourself a Jew, and you rely on the law, you rely on the Ten Commandments, and the revelation of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and because of that, you boast in God, and you know his will, and approve of what is excellent. He's going to list uh, several things, because you are instructed from the law, uh, from the Ten Commandments. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, you know, since you have this, uh, you're going to be able to help other people along a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. That is what the law says, and uh, notice that there's no argument with that at all. The Holy Spirit is not saying that the law of God uh, doesn't have all of those qualities. The point is much different. The point is, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, certainly has all those qualities. You can anticipate every one of those qualities. That's not the problem. The problem is what? You then who teach others this law, you do not teach yourself. While you preach against stealing, you steal. In other words, while you, and now he's going to distinguish a few of the individual Ten Commandments, uh, and he's simply going to say, sure, you're proud of the fact that you have the Ten Commandments. You actually know the value of these Ten Commandments, and he listed all of them. We'll go over them again. But even knowing the Ten Commandments, knowing the value of the Ten Commandments, knowing precisely uh, how important they are in your lives, nevertheless, you don't act accordingly. Therefore, you're no different than the Gentiles. That's his point. You then who teach others, verse 21, do you not teach yourself while you preach against stealing? Do you steal? Uh, you who say that one must not commit adultery, 
do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you uh, rob uh, temples? You who boast in the law, you who say we're special because we've received the special revelation of God. You are proud of the fact that you're a Christian. Yes, we're biblical Christians. We have the special revelation of God. You do that, but at the same time, you dishonor God. And how is God dishonored? Not by having a negative emotional feeling. God is not dishonored because of your decreased introspection. God is dishonored by the objective breaking of his law. You break the law of God, that dishonors and it discredits God. And it's that uh, simple. Uh, for it is written, and now he's going to quote a, a combination of Isaiah and Ezekiel. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And what he's reminding them of is uh, the call that produced this special revelation. He's saying, you're calling yourself a Jew? I called you. Uh, Abraham was a pagan from the Ur of Chaldees. He wasn't Jewish, he was a Gentile. And I called him and I said, I will set my love on you. Look up in the stars in the sky and that's how the nation will grow under you. And from Abraham on I blessed you and I blessed you and I blessed you until you had David himself. And I told you I was blessing you for one purpose only. Not because you were so special. Not because you had this intrinsic righteousness that, that no one else had. Uh, not because you were somehow in a stratification system where you were better off than the Canaanites just by virtue of your DNA. No, no, no. I blessed you because you were a nobody. And I blessed you to do something. I blessed you to be a light to the nations. And I gave you my law as a disclosure of my character. And I said, you live for me in front of these people and you will be the light of the world that you're supposed to be. But that did not happen, did it? It did not. And because they discredited God by abandoning his law, by living any way they wanted to live, it became a discredit to the name of God. And so Israel was judged and placed into exile because of disobedience to the law of God. And the prophets came along as covenant prosecutors, saying, you have disobeyed God, and now I'm going to take everything from you, and you're going to go back to Babylon, which is where you started. See the circle? And so Paul now writes to Jews and reminds them of their history in the church. Don't think you're anything unique and special uh, because of that. And he quotes the word of God to establish that. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning, I pray that as uh, we uh, negotiate our way through this passage, finding our way through what can be rough waters, uh, that you uh, will be with us through your Spirit. Teach us your ways this morning, I pray, for the sake of Christ. Amen. Uh, you know, when uh, you first show up at high school, they give you the big, now they used to, so I'm dating myself. They'd, remember they'd call you in, you'd have the big assembly. And our principal's name was Jerome LaPelletier. <laughs> He was a lawyer. Uh, and uh, the Old Orchard Beach School District hired him uh, because uh, he was retired and they thought, well, this guy would be a great principal. And it turns out he was, by the way. I love Jerome LaPelletier. Ended up corresponding with him until he died. Uh, but he would bring us all into the uh, gymnasium at Old Orchard Beach High School. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you again, we were the seagulls, the mighty, mighty seagulls. <laughs> So we would gather there in our seagull warrior spirit <laughs> and he would uh, give us uh, the briefing. And he was a lawyer, so he knew how to give a briefing. And these are the things you have to pay attention to. And these are the things you have to do. And he would always punctuate uh, that uh, speech by saying, don't forget what I've told you. 
it's going to matter. You're going to need this information. And I'm going to ask you whether or not uh, you applied the information I gave you. Uh, and then we'd be off and running to our very first classes, whatever uh, they may be. Uh, and then uh, if you were, you know, me, maybe, <laughs> um, you might have forgotten one of the rules. And uh, you might be, and I'm just saying this is theoretical, be in his office. <laughs> and he would say, don't you remember what I told you? Now, you, you have a couple answers uh, there, but with Jerome LaPelletier, none of them were plausible answers. He knew what he told you, he knew he was a clear communicator, and he knew he meant what he said. And so you were defenseless. And you just had to admit, yeah, I guess I heard it, and I guess I didn't do it. Now that's Christians. Now we come... And we say that we are going to be guided and shaped by our Creator. Uh, this is our life. This is the pivot point of our existence. This is the hub of the wheel. Uh, and then uh, when He speaks, uh, we end up with uh, two or three options because we don't quite like everything He said, particularly in regard to the Ten Commandments. Uh, if I say to you, you need to live the Ten Commandments, some of you will say, that's a bit controversial. Now think about what level of foolishness you have to arrive at to then describe the Ten Commandments of God as a controversial offering to you as a Christian. Think about that for a minute. We'll get back to that. Uh, and so we don't like two or three of uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, we certainly don't like the command to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, I'm preaching to the choir since you're here, but you know, everybody didn't show up. <laughs> uh, we don't like that. We don't like honor your uh, mother and father. We don't really like that too much. Everybody's always asking me for what the workaround is on that one. And I say, I have a Bible verse for you. They say, yeah, my father was awful. So good, I've got a Bible verse for you. You do? Yeah, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Uh, we don't like any of the thou shalt not commit adultery because adultery covers every sexual sin. So we're now virtually a culture who it's okay to live together. Uh, it's okay to have same-sex uh, 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 relationships. Uh, it's okay to celebrate that on television. In fact, we're entertained by sexuality. It's everywhere. So we don't like that one. And so we're always looking for workarounds. And so, uh, you know, you went to the big uh, briefing and you were in the gym when Jesus spoke. And you've got to come up with uh, two or three things if you don't like the law of God or maybe any particular law. You might say, I'm a seven out of ten kind of Christian. I'm a four out of ten. Uh, but what you have to say is either, number one, God didn't speak at all. He didn't speak. I guess you could say that. Uh, the Ten Commandments are just something that were uh, human manufacturing, uh, sort of some cultural thing. God did not speak, okay? You could do that. Or uh, you could say, uh, He did speak, but it's completely safe to ignore Him. Because He doesn't really judge anybody, because He didn't, you know, what's the big deal? Okay, He said it, they were nice little guidelines, but He's really not going to uh, uh, discipline you uh, if you ignore everything he said. No problem. That's option two. Uh, then option three is you can just change uh, who God is. You can make up your own God uh, and your God will be uh, the kind of guy who actually doesn't take himself seriously at all. He speaks, but he, 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 he's not even taking his own speech seriously. He doesn't actually care that much about it. Uh, so those are your three options. Uh, there is a fourth option. Sin is lawlessness, obey the law. There's option four. And that's the option that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul goes with. Because uh, what he doesn't say, 
uh, to those who have been uh, the blessed recipients of the special revelation of the Ten Commandments on Sinai, what he doesn't say is, no worries, just let it go. What he says is, because you've received these and because they benefit your life greatly and because you then ignore them, you are a hypocrite. That's what he says. In other words, he takes the law of God just as seriously as Jesus took it. And what did Jesus say? Not the least stroke of the pen will pass from the law of God. I have come to fulfill, to complete the law of God. Not the least stroke of the pen will pass away from the law. Not the least stroke. Uh, so uh, I want to try to, before we come to the Lord's table, give you uh, two or three ideas from this passage. And I'm going to do it by just giving you three words. Just remember these three words and you'll get it, okay? All right. First of all, benefits. Benefits. We benefit for something. Now, we benefit without acknowledging the benefit, but it's a benefit. It's a blessing. That's the first word. The second word also starts with B. I know. Boasting. Uh, even though we benefit from something, we boast as if we did it ourselves. We receive a blessing, but boasting is when you receive something, but pretend that you're the one that earned it instead of received it. Benefit, boasting, and then finally, a word that you've come not to like anymore. And this is a signal that you have a problem. Because you don't like the word blasphemy. And that's the third word. To disobey God is to blaspheme God. Uh, and, and we've come to an era in evangelical Christianity where I regret uh, to tell you that there are people who describe themselves as Christians that don't think blasphemy is even possible. Believe me, it is. So, let's look at these three words. Benefit, boasting, and blasphemy. First of all, uh, benefits. Look what he does uh, when he starts. He says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law, you perfectly accept the Ten Commandments, and not only you accept them, you accept them in such a way is that you brag about it. You boast about it. And look what he does, and he now details all kinds of benefits of having the law. Uh, you, first of all, you know his will. Uh, you didn't uh, have an opportunity to know his will until God disclosed himself. So God says, this is who I am. Uh, this is uh, what my will is. Uh, you also get a chance to approve of what is excellence. Uh, you begin to know the difference between what is excellent and what is garbage. The law teaches you to distinguish uh, between those uh, two things. Uh, you also know that you are instructed from the law. In other words, you receive guidance. Uh, I've been uh, the recipient of all kinds of guidance in the cap last couple weeks. Lawyers give you guidance. That's their word for telling you what the law says and doesn't say. Well, let me give you some guidance on that, Steve. Well, that's what the law of God does. It guides you. It gives you a, a, a path to run on. Uh, and not only that, you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind. All this benefit uh, now makes you in a position to help other people. Uh, you can show other people uh, the benefits of the law, and you are light to those in darkness. Now you become an instructor of the foolish. You begin to teach your children uh, these things, having the law of God, what? As the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Don't go past that too quickly. The Ten Commandments are the embodiment, the very embodiment of the knowledge and the truth of your Creator. This is what he wanted you to know. So, when we think of the word benefit, let me describe the Ten Commandments uh, for you and what it is that God wanted to do. The law of God describes the good life. Now, I know you've been watching commercials and you think the good life uh, is improved by whatever beer you drink. But I've got bad news. 
a beer comes and goes. Do I have to be more graphic than that? <laughs> you need something eternal. You need something that's going to laugh. Uh, or maybe, uh, you know, your whole advertising industry is designed to show you that your life is sort of pitiful as it is unless you purchase this particular merchandise. So I'll finally achieve the good life when I drive the car that I need. I will finally achieve the good life when I get the right girl. I'll finally achieve the, the good life when I get the right house with the right curb appeal to it so other people know that I've achieved the good life. The good life is everything that God says it isn't. And now God comes to a bunch of wandering people out in the desert who have been in captivity uh, to uh, Egyptian idolatry for 400 years. And he comes to them and he says, look, no offense, but you don't know for nothing. Uh, your children have forgotten who I am. Uh, you have uh, been away from me for a long time, and now I have redeemed you out of Egypt. And the blood has been sprinkled on the doorpost uh, so that you can now receive the salvation that I have offered and the atonement that I have made for you. I didn't ask you to live the law and then redeem you. I redeemed you, and now, after redeeming you by my grace and by my mercy, doing something that you actually didn't deserve, I'm going to now show you what the good life looks like. And I'm going to give you these Ten Commandments as a description of the good life. This is what it will look like, and I've hardwired my creation to work this way. Uh, and uh, if you want it to work, and all the circuitry to work the way it's supposed to work, uh, you will follow these commandments and everything will fall into place. However, uh, if you violate these commands, I have designed the hardwiring of the system to backfire on you and it's going to short circuit and it's not going to do anything that you think it's going to do. So sex outside of marriage will look fun for you for the evening, but you'll wake up thinking, what did I do? Uh, it will always backfire. Uh, you will never, ever, living together, as just one example, because this is in the passage, adultery, if you're living together, uh, for you know, so people say to me, well, we've been living together for 12 years. I say, great, 12 years of celebrating the fact that someone doesn't have enough commitment. Because that's what that is. You know why you're not getting married? Because you're not really committed yet. And what that means is that the thing that you're calling love isn't the kind of love that causes you to flourish. Because the kind of love that causes you to flourish is built on 100% lifetime commitment one to another. And God says, if you use that in the way that I uh, didn't design it, it will actually backfire on you. Just one example, the good life. So that is God's description of the good life. But we ignore it. We don't care. Oh, sure, we can do anything we want to do. Uh, we can uh, say anything out of our... You, you know, the command uh, uh, not to lie is a command to proactively tell the truth. This is what Jesus is talking... You know what the Sermon on the Mount is, right? The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' sermon on the Ten Commandments. That's all it is. And every one of the ethical commands in Scripture are built on the Ten Commandments. Every single one. They are all an application of one of the Ten Commandments. And so, uh, uh, the ability for us to lie is enormous, isn't it? I mean, we've got so many denial systems and juicy little white lies that we tell, I mean, before we're finished breakfast. But we're told to be truth-tellers. So we struggle with that. We never quite uh, get it right. It's the good life that we're called to. So just let me give you a, kind of an overview culturally. Uh, no a culture in the history of mankind has ever gotten better by ignoring the Ten Commandments. Ever. Civilization is built on the Ten Commandments. They're built on the law of God. 
They're built on truth-telling. They're built on having fidelity in your relationships. They're built on the fact that you can keep your stuff without some knucklehead coming and taking it. It's built on the fact that you don't have to be the recipient of violence and murder. Civilization is built on the law of God. And now you are living in a culture that not only is the recipient of the benefits of God's law, but deny that that God who gave them the benefits even exists in the first instance. You know who Rodney Stark is? Rodney Stark is a very well-known uh, sociologist. Uh, he's written some of the more seminal books uh, textbooks in sociology in America. Uh, he started out at Berkeley and then for many years was uh, professor at University of Washington uh, and now I believe is at Baylor uh, University. Uh, Pulitzer Prize nominee, that kind of thing. He's written 30, 40 books uh, and hundreds and hundreds of uh, articles in the area of sociology. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is written to the academic community. He is very well known. But there's a book that you would like to read by him if you feel like going back to Sociology 101. And he titled the book, America's Blessings. And he wrote it about 10 years ago. And I'll just give you quickly the premise of the book. Through complete and reliable sociological research, and every sociologist knows it, that communities, cities, towns, where people go to church have less crime, less struggles, and by the way, if you're a government type, means it costs the government less money because they don't have to prosecute you. Every sociologist knows this, and one of his points in the book is, he said, I am in the center of the academic sociological community, and he said, I have to constantly challenge other sociologists why they are completely ignoring these studies. And the reason is they're godless to start with. The law of God brings the good life. The law of God brings civilization that God promised. And so, no culture in the history of mankind has ever improved itself by ignoring and abandoning the law of God. None. But that's what we're doing now, and you're going to watch it disintegrate. I'm just telling you. Benefits. Uh, second thing he talks about is boasting. Benefits in boasting. Because the point is, you have all these benefits, but the boasting is a problem because you boast that you have them, think about this now, at the same time you act as if they're not important in your life. This would be the equivalent of a guy saying, I'm really proud of my wife. I love my wife. She's the best thing since sliced bread. I can't believe the Lord blessed me with a woman like that. She's absolutely wonderful. I have never had a woman who has given me so much, and I have given her so little. I have never been so blessed to have this woman in my life. Do you want to sleep with me? No. Has all the benefits of a great wife, but he's acting like a tramp out on the road. Now, what do you think of a guy like that? You don't respect him, do you? Well, the reason you don't respect him is because you have the law of God written across your conscience. You know that guy's a knucklehead from the get-go, don't you? You don't have to be preached to in church about that. You know he's a knucklehead. You never had to go to church in your life to know that. Because you're creating God's image. But that's exactly what... Paul is warning about. Don't begin to boast about everything that the Lord has given you and everything that you have benefited from and at the same time you're boasting about your faith. At the same time you're telling people, yes, it's great to be a Christian. At the very same moment you're doing that, you are disobeying the very law that you're proud to have. That's a level of hypocrisy that brings discredit to the Lord. And you can bet that's going to make the news. You can fill the stadiums with 15, 20,000 people run up and down playing the piano. I'm talking about Jimmy Swagger now. Speaking in tongues, getting all ecstatic, doing all this stuff. But where are they going to find you? In a motel room with a hooker. 
that brings discredit to the name of the Lord. Why? Because the law of God matters. And we're supposed to meditate on it day and night. It's supposed to be like honey in a honeycomb to you. It's supposed to taste good. It's supposed to be sweet. It's supposed to be what we're attracted to. And we're not attracted to it. So this is how the law of God works in the Christian life. Uh, and I put it this way. The law of God is a mirror, not a monument. The law of God is a mirror, not a monument. And what I mean by that is that the law of God shows you who a holy God is. What does a holy God look like? He looks like this. And so instead of setting up a monument to ourselves where we say, hey, isn't it grand that God gave me this revelation of himself? We're supposed to look at the law of God as a mirror. And as we look at that, we say, you know what? I am not able to live that level of holiness. And it's supposed to drive us to the only one who ever did fulfill the law, Jesus Christ. Because he is the law keeper, our substitute law keeper. And because he has substituted his law keeping for our law breaking, we are now the recipients of his grace and his mercy. The law is a mirror to drive us to the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. The law teaches us to repent. The law teaches us to trust Christ alone uh, as our righteousness. And that's what we're supposed to boast in. Not the fact that we received uh, the revelation. We're supposed to boast in the fact that we have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone as the perfect satisfaction for a holy God. And so it will, it will, eliminate us from the wrath of God. That's what we're saved from, the wrath of God. The benefits that the law of God gives uh, and the boasting. Everybody loves the gifts, but we pretend the giver doesn't exist. You love living in an environment where people don't lie to you. You love being married to a guy who doesn't cheat on you. Uh, you uh, love uh, people who won't steal from you every time uh, you turn around. Uh, you love people who aren't always jealous about your stuff. You love uh, people who uh, uh, treat their mom well. Uh, you uh, love uh, people who are the church-going types, reliable types. You love all that. And at the same time, you pretend God doesn't exist. You love the gifts that the Lord has brought to humanity. You just don't love the giver of the gifts. Benefits and boasting in the wrong thing. Finally, blasphemy. Because uh, what does blasphemy do? It says, uh, uh, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, what do you do? You dishonor God by breaking the law. Let me say that again, because this is written for you. You and you and you and you dishonor God by breaking the law. The Ten Commandments aren't suggestions. They're not. And this might be the only church in the state of Maine that will tell you that. But thanks be to God, even though we're all lawbreakers, we have a law keeper. And Jesus Christ came to do something, to live the law of God. And he did it because we didn't. Do you remember, you don't know what this code is, but if you go back and read Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, there's a great line uh, that uh, Ezekiel uh, says there, uh, because uh, they're breaking the law of God with impunity, and the nations are not coming to Christ. And, and so uh, uh, the prophet uh, says something, these are the people of the Lord? You call these people Christians? These are the people of the Lord? And that's exactly what happens to us. Moral decay is not neutral. Moral decay dishonors God, and moral decay is going to bring his judgment and his wrath. It's that simple. But you have good news. You have the gospel, because Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the second eternal person of the Trinity, took on human flesh 
and he lived the law of God perfectly for you. And so now you are not merely saved by uh, his death on Calvary. You are saved because he lived the law of God and was perfectly obedient even when you could not be. And he now gives you his obedience as a gift. And people always say, what would Jesus do? I already know what he did. Jesus lived the Ten Commandments. Do you think Jesus ever broke a Ten Commandment? Do you think Jesus ever did not honor his father and his mother? Do you think for one second of Jesus' life, he didn't love the Lord, the God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength? And I always like to say, you think Jesus ever missed church to go up to camp? You think? You think he was ever jealous about anybody else's stuff? You think he ever harbored hatred in his heart? You think he ever lied? You think he was sexually unfaithful? You think, he'd, you think he'd march along with the LGBTQ parade downtown? You think he'd be right there with them? Are you kidding me? Wake up. No. Jesus came and he lived the Ten Commandments. And so if you say to me, how should I be more like Jesus? Live the Ten, baby. Live the Ten. Say, I can't do that. Of course you can't do that. But you, if you have trusted Christ for your righteousness alone, He indwells you through His Spirit. And guess what the job of the Spirit of God is to do? Is to conform you to the image of the law-keeping Jesus. So you will look more like a law-keeper. You will begin to love the law of God just as much as Jesus loved the law that He wrote on Sinai with His Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, where are you going to land on this? Did God mean what he said? Do you take God seriously? If you do, then you need to love everything he said. And when you love everything he said, you'll understand that the benefits are the benefits of his gifting to you. You'll understand that the boasting is not boasting in yourself, but boasting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ who alone fulfilled the law for you. And you'll understand that to disregard the law of God isn't merely a fun cultural idea of the moment, but it's blasphemy. And you need to repent. I pray that as you come to the table this morning, you'll come to the table as people who love the law of God and meditate on it day and night. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning as we come to the table, I pray that we will come as people who know your word, respect your word, and ask the Holy Spirit to help us live it every day. We pray these things for the sake of Jesus. Amen.